Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, the CEO Institute uh, seminar uh, on effective CEO leadership uh, in a crisis. I'm, I'm joined this afternoon by uh, Jacqueline Wilcox and Scott Bennett from East Rugby, who I'll uh, be introducing a little bit later. But before I do that, I'll uh, give you a bit of an idea and set the scene for uh, how, how we'll run this afternoon. It's going to be very informal. Uh, we're going to open up the floor for questions in about 12 minutes. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, you can go onto your player. Uh, on the bottom right-hand corner, there is a questions button. So just uh, it's called ask a question. Just uh, press that and by all means ask a question and we will come to that during the course of uh, today's seminar. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, um, I'm currently um, a managing director for a company called Greensill Capital who provides supply chain finance uh, globally for uh, large corporates. Uh, prior to that, uh, I've worked in large corporates myself um, in Asia for uh, just over a decade um, in global roles with Philips uh, and probably more recently here in Australia, uh, I've done a number of startups uh, and involved in startups, uh, run three listed entities, uh, Engine, uh, Look Mobile, uh, Mobile Innovations, and then I think more recently, uh, Anitel, and then overseas, we did a, uh, a startup called Myriad Group, uh, whereby uh, we had three billion handsets, um, uh, mobile handsets. We did on the software for, um, for um, Apple, Microsoft, and, and Google, who are our main three clients. Uh, I'm on the board of um, a chairman at the National Centre for Suicide Prevention and Training currently, and I do a, a fair amount of advisory work. I'm a chair at the CEO Institute. I, I chair two groups, Syndicate 61 and Syndicate 70, and the range of brands involved in those groups range from uh, Clemens of BBDO up to Woolworths. Um, so it's, it's quite varied in terms of the participation that we have in those groups. So welcome again. Uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll introduce uh, our, our panel and our guest speakers. Uh, firstly, I have an apology from... Uh, Michael Steele, those that are in Sydney would be well aware that we've got some terrific storms outside, so a crisis in the making to a certain extent, but um, Michael Steele, uh, his house is uh, under, uh, um, under some pressure and he has to resolve some personal issues at home, so he has sent his apologies. Michael's from Pacific West Foods. Uh, I also have with me the group CEO for uh, East Rugby, which does include um, the Mighty Roosters, um, uh, he's also, Michael's, uh, sorry, Scott's also a member of the Australian uh, Club Gaming Council. Uh, he originally started work uh, at the Sydney Harbour Casino, which is now known as uh, Star City Casino. He has a, a degree at, from the University of Wollongong in a Bachelor of Commerce, uh, majoring in uh, marketing, and he's also done a diploma in business in club management. So wel welcome today, and thanks uh, for your participation. Thank you, Eva. Our guest speaker today is... Uh, Jacqueline Wilcox. Uh, Jacqueline is the Executive Vice President uh, and Head of Corporate and Public Affairs for Weber Shanwick Australia. She's an expert in um, corporate and public affairs and uh, specifically in crisis recovery. And I think we'll um, get quite a lot of experience in terms of you, uh, some of the companies that you've dealt with most recently. We were having a little bit of a conversation earlier. She's very well known for crisis management and advising CEOs on how to effectively uh, deal with the uh, issues at hand, uh, and that's across a number of sectors, including defence, mining, shipping, pharmaceutical, infant formula, which I'm sure everyone's aware of, and obviously food and beverages, which we'll uh, go into a fair bit of detail. She's an experienced journalist, having worked at the ABC, Channel 10, and The Australian. So welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you. So what, what, what I might do is, is just to kind of set the tone a little bit, uh, ask Jacqueline to maybe do... Give us some background on your experience in terms of crisis management and maybe uh, talk to a, one or two case studies. Mm. And whilst Jacqueline's doing that, please don't hesitate to hop online and uh, uh, ask questions uh, by hitting that Ask That Question uh, button on the bottom right-hand corner of your player. Well, look, thank you for that. I thought I, would, uh, I thought I was coming here today to talk about uh, the infant formula crisis that we had in New Zealand where uh, some infant formula was wrongly branded contaminated um, by botulism and the company rightly withdrew batches of that product knowing that it, their own testing was showing that there was nothing wrong with it and then, of course, 
weeks later discover that they were right and that their product was never contaminated but nonetheless they've incurred a great deal of uh, brand damage plus a you know, great deal of financial loss. So I thought I'd talk about that because one, we're quite proud of it. Um, it, was, it crossed uh, eight uh, uh, jurisdictions, so there were multiple recalls in different countries. However, when I thought we'd done and dusted with infant formula, I've actually just stepped off the plane from New Zealand where I have been dealing with another infant formula crisis, fortunately not just for this brand, but for the, uh, unfortunately for the entire, um, for, the, you know, for all infant formula. And that is that, unfortunately, in New Zealand, many of you will know that a, uh, for want of a better term, terrorist has threatened to put 1080 in all infant formula should the government not accede to this person's um, uh, you know, demands. Uh, and so you can imagine what that's like over there. That's like that for all brands. So, you know, you just think you, you've, you've actually dusted one crisis and you've got that company through and you're helping that company in recovery and then lo and behold something like this comes along which is, you know, quite devastating for everybody involved. So where would you like to start? What would I say to a CEO if they rang me today and, si and said that? And um, we were talking earlier about how one approaches, uh, you know, any crisis and what I would say and what we were discovering earlier is that if you have some sort of plan, you're halfway there. If you've actually sat down with your management team, and it doesn't matter if it's 15 or 2 or 3, and you've developed a plan of what one does in a crisis and everybody knows their roles, you're halfway there. Even if you decide that you have to chuck that out, even if you decide on the day that actually... It's not relevant. At least you've had the dis discipline in your thinking that you, you know, you're, you're in the process. So that's one of the things I would say. The other thing I would say, without wanting to scare everybody, is that good things come from crises. And one of the things I've learned recently with, say, the Denon Nutrition um, uh, contaminated, well actually it was Fonterra contaminated product that went into the Denon Nutrition product. But um, what I would say is that that company um, learned a lot about itself, a lot of good things. The CEO was two days in the, in the country. She'd only just arrived that week when, lo and behold, Friday at six o'clock this hits. So she got to know her management team really well. And she dived in and she, she fortunately starred and shone and she continues to do that. So there are some good things that come from it. So, so on, on that particular incident, um, did the company actually have a plan in place? Yes. With a fresh CEO coming in who probably wasn't even aware of what the plan was? Uh, look, I think that she's from the company. Yes. She was an internal uh, in another jurisdiction, but she, the company fortunately is well known for its training. And as luck would happen, uh, about two weeks before this hit, I was involved in a real life scenario with the company on the site. She wasn't there, of course, but with the management team. And we were going through a number of scenarios. And really, one of them was roughly what actually happened. So it was all a bit spooky, actually, when we were sitting around the boardroom at two o'clock in the morning drinking Diet Coke and eating silly food. Um, we were all remarking on how like, like the uh, scenario it was. She had been through a lot of training. She was about to be media trained by me the following week. We never got around to that. We were media training in the back of cabs and all sorts of things. So um, I have to say that the company being, being a, a training company, that shone through. But yes, they, they have their own they had their own protocol. They had their own... Everybody knew what their role was. Some, that was tested, of course. Some people shone in those roles. Some people realised that they weren't as good in the role that, that they thought they would be and they've, they've mixed around. But I think the training was absolutely vital in, in them getting through it. And, and in terms of message and getting her on message, we've very, we've next to no training and, mm. and, and briefings in the back of cabs. Mm. I mean, how effective was that in terms of... Get, Reducing stress on the company to start off with and employees that are involved in the whole process, everyone mm. does get quite anxious when something negative starts occurring in the business. Mm. Um, uh, how quickly were you able to get her um, briefed and, and trained up to make sure that the message that was going out was effective and simple? And well, fortunately, she was there from the moment that the phone call came in. It just, you know, we got the phone call from the regulator and suddenly everybody's doing their own roles and I get I, I got called in. So she knew the brief, but I think what was interesting is that we, uh, she, because she, I think she's so well trained and just the type of person that she is, um, she was trusting people. So, so she decided that I was there as an advisor and she was going to trust me, which 
took a lot of courage given that she didn't really know me and that was quite helpful because I was able to stand back and say well look we don't need to go in there and say you know, as, as much as people want us to say we need to hold back we need to be responsive to the media but we also need to be responsible and I think this is where the real guidance comes in when you actually can make that judgment about how much do you say and that doesn't mean that you don't say much at all but it means when do you roll out your CEO when do you have people like my team handling the media and telling the media you know the, the answers and uh, so uh, we decided we made a decision with her that we would only put her in front of the media when we had something to say, something new to say, something informative, because we were dealing with parents here who had to feed their babies. And we were knew the emotion of that. And we had a call centre that was being inundated with frantic mums. What do I feed my baby? Uh, so we had to make sure that we did nothing to exacerbate their their fears but we also did as much as we could to make them feel comfortable in the role you know in the decisions that they had to make so we only wheeled her out can I say to the media I think it was about three or four times now there was a, and I have to say there were times when I was looking at myself in the mirror in the morning going did I make the right decision but I'm glad we did it because at the end of it it turned out that there were other people out there sadly because they were giving messaging that wasn't right and then they would have to subsequently take out full-page advertisements to correct what they were saying. We decided we actually did do the right thing. That she And also the journalists knew that when we called a media conference and she was going to be there, they knew that there was something new to say and that something that was going to either you know, change the way the... the uh, the crisis was going, we were able to give some answers. No point in wheeling out your CEO if all they're going to do is repeat the same old, same old. Yeah. So in, in terms of the reputational damage, was there a measure done for what that impact was in dollar terms for that particular business? Yes. And, and how much of the, um, the management of that uh, you know, uh, helped to limit that impact? Well, I would, of course, say the management was massively good and it stopped all sorts of problems happening. But what I can say is, of course, you actually have a people who are in this industry know that you have sales and you have, you have all sorts of measurement in that area. And I won't go into that. We certainly know we did th those people are expert at it and, and they certainly can make that judgment. What I can say, and this is where it was very pleasing, is that um, the call centre and the helpline got some very good feedback from, from the core, from, from the mums who are using the product, feeding it to their babies. And the other thing that came out was that the media commentary. She was actually praised on some of the media programs and people said that she was caring and she was concise and she was considered. Unfortunately, some of the other players in there for various reasons weren't so. So she got a great deal of positive um, signs from that and, we, and the, the, in that comes the problems because, because she was quite well regarded, then the media want more and you still have to then hold back and say, no, 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 we don't have anything more to say and we don't want to waste anybody's time. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of measurement that, that is done and some of it is actually a bit of judgment that, that experienced people make. And in, in terms of advice to a CEO when, when they are in that crisis mode and mm. about about to hit. Mm. What, 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 what are the, you know, the top four points that you make? Look, I think uh, it, it, look, each crisis is, is different. I mean, that's a, you know, a terrible old saying, but it's true. But I have to say that where there has been some suffering or pain caused in, in any situation, one has to always acknowledge that. You can, when you're in a crisis, get caught up with handling the nitty-gritty of it, but you have to, at the end of the day, remember that, that you're talking to people who are whose lives have been changed in some way, whether it's you know, a terrible tragedy or whether it is that they're just terribly inconvenienced. One has to keep remembering that and, and, and it reminding not only yourself and your team of that, but also letting the people know that you are aware of that. So I think that that's absolutely right. Don't, don't do a conference unless you've got something to say. You've got a lot of media staff, a lot of advisors who can handle that media. So don't be bullied into doing things you don't want to do. And, you know, there's some classic um, examples of some people going on air being flattered, as we say, flattered into powerlessness, being, demand, you know, being demanded by the media and wanting to be the centre of attention, getting on there and not knowing their subject, not having any answers. People want a lot of answers in a yes. crisis. So I'd say things, things like that. I think trust your team. Certainly don't try to do everything. 
that there is, really have some roles and designated roles and trust the people who are in those roles. What I say to people in my situation as the advisor uh, is that my role is to actually metaphorically stick my arm around my client and say, you know, I'm with you on this. Now there is a problem because you are there, you, you are living it and you are feeling their pain, but you also have to take a step back sometimes and be quite cruel in the, some of the questions that you ask and some of the criticism that you give. Not all the time, but you won't have, you know help if you're always going to be on, on the team. She's got a good team in my situation in this case, got a good management team. Yes, I'm part of that management team, but I'm also on the outside throwing stuff in saying, have we thought of this, have we thought of that? One, one, one of the questions that we have from um, the group that are out there listening is, you know, you know the challenge of managing a, an organisation's reputation for the long term and not falling into this transparent pin, spin process mm. that we um, see our governments falling into on a regular basis, uh, especially during a time of crisis. I mean, what's, what's your advice in terms of how do you, how do you manage that? Like very, very fine balance between it being spin, but it being a believable story that everyone's going to can understand and can relate to. How, how do you? Well, I'm going to give you a, a, an answer that you probably think's a bit ho hum, but I actually don't get this spin thing. I really don't deal in it, and, I, and I, it's not a practiced answer. But I don't actually deal in spin, and there's no need to call me in if that's what you want, because. Usually I've done, I'm with a client, I, some, often I get called in the middle of a crisis, I've never met them before, but then they stay on as a client and we start building plans and getting them involved in some sort of strategy so they don't get in that trouble. But often clients like the one that I've just been referring to, I've had as a client for a long time and been involved in helping them with getting their own crisis plans and those sorts of things. So one is aware of what the company's objective is and what its values are. And um, they're not just, you know, stock standard 80s type, you know, sayings of value. It's actually something that, I mean, you'd have it in your business too, that people live and breathe. And if you as an advisor know what those values are and keep an, keep an eye on those when you're in a crisis and help the management team keep those to the front, then I think you, you won't need to go down that spin thing. Yeah. Because you, you know why you're there and you know what your purpose is. All right. No, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. Scott, in terms of questions on this particular case study, that's a, do you have any questions for Jacqueline at all on this particular case study? No, I haven't done much with baby food lately. <laughs> But our food, look, any, any product is, which is a product that where the, the, the purchaser has put faith in you, uh, it, it's the same sort of thing. When you're actually saying, here, purchase this and you can drink it or you can give it to your five-day-old baby and you can trust me for it. That's a whole, you know, that's uh, an extraordinary relationship to have. Uh, and it's very, very complex. If we look at what's occurred in China over the last couple of years, you know, there's a couple of million people crossing the border into Hong Kong every day mm. to go and buy the infant baby formula mm. because they can't trust the product that they can buy in China. Mm. And that's putting an enormous amount of stress on Hong Kong itself. And that's, uh, you know, when it comes to our children, mm. um, it, it is, it is a, a very, um, you know, from a parent's perspective, it's, it's, it's a deep um, uh, concern and love that we have for them. And, you know, it's, you know, we'll do anything to basically protect their safety and, and well-being. And, and I can well understand it. it's, a, it's a complex matter to go through. Um, well, can I just say that's why the current uh, crisis that's happening in New Zealand where this ghastly person has threatened the entire Industry, and it's not just infant formula, quite frankly. If this person is crazy enough to threaten infant formula, he or she is crazy enough to threaten. It could be bananas next or, or whatever. But um, that is why uh, I've been impressed um, being involved in that crisis because every company, not just the company that I represent, has... You, has extremely good testing all the way through their process. That's that's a given. Where the weaknesses are, are sort of when they leave the factory and in the supermarkets. And how does one how does one always protect something that's on a shelf? Or you know, you, you, supermarkets do the best they can with all sorts of uh, protocols in place and CCTV footage and guards and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, we can't actually protect everything, can we? But the, the general public don't understand all those processes behind it and with the power of social media uh, it can be leaked that you know, there's a threat mm. so how does that get quashed and so people believe that you know, this infant formula is safe 
But it wouldn't take much for a mother to be worried. No, it doesn't. And in understandably the, so. No, it doesn't. And in that situation, in the one that I've just been referring to in the 1080 one, the Prime Minister um, gave the statements and talked about how he had faith and he'd, he and his team had uh, investigated the uh, manufacturing process and were quite sure that those processes were safe. So... Um, you know, you have people at that level talk about that there are all sorts of security pl um, provisions in, in place and people can be as confident as that they ever can be that things are there to try and thwart anyone getting, getting anywhere near the product. If anything, it's probably safer now than it ever was, but, uh, and most products are. The, the social media thing, when you talk about quashing, I, um, I, I don't think you can quash anything, really. I, I, I just don't understand how that could ever happen. It'll come out sooner or later. Uh, and I think the fear of social media is something, is another thing that we can talk about later. But for me, one doesn't need to be so afraid of social media. It's just another channel of communicating. Yeah. It's not like we had to have special plans when television came in or when radio came in, when they say to me, we've got this other thing called social media. Well, what are you talking about? Facebook, you know, uh, Twitter? What else? Your blogs? What, what else? Are we, why is there such a mystery about it? Well, one of the questions from our audience, and this one's from Stephanie, she, she asked, in, in terms of uh, Caricare infant formula, the first case study that we were talking about, did the company already have a call centre or, or was it set up at short notice to meet the no. particular crisis? No, the company does have a call centre. It has a, what's called a care line. And um, I've sat in that care line many a time where they have uh, very experienced, um, usually maternal nurses, who answer all sorts of questions from mothers about feeding or whatever uh, with their babies. And in this situation, those care line women worked 24-7. What happened was that the care line was tooled up so more people... People were on it. I have to say that even the MD was on the care line at some stage. I mean, they all, the management team did turns on the care line. Yeah. One bit just to make sure that the calls were answered, but also it helped them get a feeling of what the people were thinking and, and you know, where, what sort of messaging was working and whether or not we were, we were helping people or, or, or not. And was the company and, and, and your company scripting answers for the call centre or were you just allowing the dialogue to occur between the nurses and the, and the consumers through that process? Uh, there's, there's both. Yeah. Uh, there are some standard questions that one can anticipate. You know, what were the batch numbers? For, in this situation, there are only a few batches that yeah. were at risk. So what are the batch numbers? What do I look for? Those sorts of things. Um, you know, how did this occur? Why is it, you know, the who, what, when, where and why. Is, they're they're the, the questions and answers that can be scripted. But one would never want to get in the way of those conversations that the maternal nurses have with their mothers because they were... You know, fantastic, really, yeah. and that's really what the company is about: is communicating and standing by mums to help look after their their babies. Yeah, but I mean, there's two very, very different case studies there. One is uh, there was an actual contamination of infant baby formula, uh, and the, the second no, was all... no, there wasn't. No, there was. A, it, what happened was that this is where it gets complicated. The um, the base powder. The people who supplied the base powder to, Fonte uh, to Danone Nutrition, who make Caricare, believed that their, that their product was contaminated. Yes. The testing at Caricare was that it wasn't. But nonetheless, because they believed it and their testing showed that it, that it was, it was yeah. uh, we went ahead with it. Of course, weeks later, it turned out that their tests were wrong. They got false positives. Yeah. And the Caricare tests were always right. It's nice to be right in hindsight, but nonetheless, a great deal of damage was caused, not to mention the frustration to parents. Yeah. And, and in this second case, there's a, there's a threat from um, uh, someone to go and actually do something, but not actually do it. They haven't actually done anything at this point in time, so there was no evidence to show that something had actually no, occurred. No, 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 it's just and, a threat. Yeah. And, and so they're, they're two very, very different scenarios. Mm. And in terms of advising a CEO in terms of a perceived threat, as opposed to something that... which um, was a little bit evidence-based because the supplier was saying that there was mm. a contamination, uh, a possible contamination mm. there. How, how would you advise a CEO in terms of dealing with something that's just a perceived threat compared to an actual crisis? I mean, they're both crises. Well, one, right, thinks of, one thinks of Marshall McLuhan that perception is reality, but 
they're not that much different. What was different in the second case, this is the, the recent 1080 threat, is that there are so many other authorities involved. So this is, a, this is actually a criminal matter. So my client is just one of many uh, companies that are potentially threatened. This person hasn't actually named which brand he or she will target or anything like that. So this is actually a, a criminal matter and um, what, what a company can't really do much but leave it to be in the hands of the experts and be guided by them and the authorities, in this case the Ministry of Primary Industries in New Zealand who are handling this with the police. Yes. Mm. So, I mean, the one of the questions that we have uh, from, from our audience is that um, in crisis, uh, it is, there's not a great deal of calm or the perception is that there isn't a great deal of calm. Mm. What's, your, what's your advice uh, in terms or tips to try and stay calm in that um, uh, very chaotic type of environment um, mm. when, when there is a, a team dealing with a crisis matter? Um, look, it sounds quite basic, but it's actually deep breaths, uh, constantly reminding people what the reality is, not going off onto what might happen, but what has happened, and, and just dealing with the issue at the moment, not planning too far ahead. Um, but also, and there are some basic things, making sure everybody's well fed. Um, seriously, making sure that there are some, some pizzas happening and people aren't operating on bad food and not enough sleep. Um, there was one, in one crisis that I've been in, uh, the human resources manager took it on herself quite rightly to make to go out and buy pyjamas, toothbrushes, shaving kits, all of those things because people were actually sleeping in the boardrooms. Well, that was the, the, the nature of that crisis. So it's often those basic things. Uh, so how, do, how does one stay calm? You just have to train yourself. You, know, you really have to train yourself to be calm, and uh, and sometimes the adrenaline gets too exciting, and it can, people can actually feed off all of that. So you do need somebody who just says, "Guys, let's chill on this," and and step, sometimes step out of the boardroom where where the action is happening and and have separate conversations. Thank you. Just a reminder to our audience that if you do have any questions uh, on the player, on the bottom right-hand corner, there's a button uh, called Ask a Question, so please uh, send any, any questions through. Um, Scott, from a sporting perspective, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a little bit more complicated that you've got this, um, you know, whilst there are crises occurring on a regular basis um, on the sporting domain, mainly because of the insatiable need for us consumers and supporters of that sport to understand what's going on with our players, there's this human element uh, that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what in any other organisation may be a, uh, um, a HR-type human issue and not of that significance, but because they're in the limelight of the media, uh, the players themselves, it becomes bigger than Ben-Hur. I mean, how, how, how does your organisation deal with those types of challenges? True. It's, it's usually a, a similar problem each time. So there's a lot of processes around that. So our, our usual player issue, usually it's um, late at night in a licensed venue um, involving alcohol and usually there's a legal issue. So we don't usually have the team ready to go in and assist. But uh, we have a great team on field, but we also have a great team off field. And the processes in place around that um, ensure that you know, the player is also looked after. Um, th there is a structure in place that you know, you've got to liaise with the governing body, which is obviously the NRL. Um, you, you, obviously, there will, there usually is a legal issue, so the, the, the player's welfare um, legally, but also mentally has to be looked after. And, and at the club, we, we do have a welfare and education department to make sure, but you also do need to to, to feed the, the, uh, the media um, as well. But that's where you just need to be um, transparent and honest, but also to a level of what you know, because sometimes you cannot display too much because there can be pending court cases at the mm. moment. Um, um, sometimes you cannot go too far or give too much information because it is unfair. Um, let's, let's not forget these players, they're young men, um, they're, they're thrust into the limelight week in, week out. Um, their work environment is, is scrutinised 
far afield um, by anyone who's on Twitter mm. in social media, um, uh, week in and week out. So, and when they make a mistake socially, um, they are ridiculed for it um, quite significantly. We've had players that have had helicopters over their house uh, for days on end um, when uh, they've made a mistake uh, in a social field for uh, what is best termed as a misdemeanour, which uh, uh, is certainly not condoned by the club. Uh, but um, uh, if anyone on this panel had happened to do it, it would not even make a, um, a paper. Mm. So we've got to make sure that the player's welfare um, is protected um, first and foremost. I mean, um, the psychological impact on a young man, you know, mm. in his early 20s, of being vilified in the press uh, for a, a minor misdemeanour, uh, on top of which, you know, there may be a small fine from, from the police associated with it, but, but the repercussions from an earnings perspective on the club fines, uh, missed opportunities in terms of uh, games that they haven't made could be incredibly significant. Mm. And, uh, I mean, how do you help... How do you help those um, players in crisis? Because they are in crisis now. They, 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 they've had a small misdemeanour. They're in crisis because their world has changed significantly and quite completely, and they're under psychological duress. What, 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 what do you do to help support those type of players in, through that process? The, the players' welfare is the most critical thing uh, for the club. So we do have a welfare and education department that has a, a number of employees and, and a psychologist. So the players, we don't only meet with the player, we will meet with their, their parents, um, uh, um, we meet with the, the player's manager. Uh, they're monitored during the, the, the crisis and even down to the little things. So if the media is camped out the front, uh, we make sure there's another avenue for the player players to come into the offices so they don't have to walk through um, the media scrutiny every day which you know, like uh, which would be um, uh, not it's a comfortable way to go into tough, yeah. so but throughout the crisis we've got to be up front with the media we've got to make sure that there is a process that we go through but we we always put the players welfare um, first and foremost and we try to be as fair and equitable with everyone yeah. Thanks, thanks, Scott. Uh, Natalia uh, asked a question, and her questions are: What are the key steps for a CEO to take to scope out the crisis so that the response is proportionate to the crisis itself or the issue at hand? Jacqueline, do you want to have a? Oh, um, the key steps. Well, let's assume that you have a crisis plan, and that you have followed that plan. Uh, to, to who it is that you talk to and who, who has responsibility. Sometimes a right, the CEO doesn't actually have to be involved until sometimes when I get called into something, it's actually an issue, issue more than it's a crisis. And um, sometimes I find that sometimes CEOs get called in before they actually need to be. It could have been handled at some other managed, part of the management structure. Uh, so what are the steps? I think the steps that the, the CEO needs to, to always do is, is test what has been put to him or her about what the situation is, quickly grasp what that situation is and then work out what, whether or not it's easy, easily resolved or whether it is going to go on for some time. And that, of course, you know, gosh, there's so many different things that can make up a crisis. Um, so without knowing the detail of that question, I'm not sure I can actually give a really valuable answer here. Um, I just think that so long as you've got a, a management team that has tested its crisis plan and has engaged as many people, without going too silly, uh, that it trusts as possible to be able to give them some advice, I think that's actually a good, a good stage to go through. If the CEO meets regularly with his or her management team, they will then have a fair idea of what's brewing. Usually, uh, when I've been involved in something, uh, it's an issue that's probably been around for some time, and if some people had have been talking outside the little tight little cocoon of the management structure, they might have been aware of that. Um, that's not to say, you know, a contamination, gosh knows, you know, you, that, that can happen any time and you, you wouldn't know about it. But there are some things, I mean, you must have, in your area, you've said that most of your crises are very fit young men going out too late at night, probably having far too much to drink mm. and being a bit silly. You've no doubt 
prepared for that and no doubt know the, the, the sort of uh, processes to go through in order to be able to effectively deal with it. And I think that's what happens when you know your own industry, you know your own, your own company, you've got a fair understanding of what's likely to happen and what can go wrong. So in, in terms of, um, I, know, I know large corporates, uh, you know, they do a, a fair amount of role playing in terms of trying to work out where competitive yep. pressures are coming from, yep. but also where unplanned crises might come from and how you might react to those types of crises. Yep. Do, you, um, do you do a lot of work with your clients um, with uh, role playing in, for an unplanned crisis and, and what they might be and have a, a potential number of different risks? That need to be yeah. managed through. Yeah, we do do that, and you can actually do, you know, set aside four hours or a day where you take take the, you know, s some of the management team, the senior parts of the team, through that, and that's, I think that's very effective, and, and one should company should do that. Not every company can actually afford it or have the time to do it. So sometimes I think it's also valuable to meet with your advisor, I'm sort of speaking for myself here, but you know, meet with other people who can challenge you. Who can, who, and, and I've got clients like that where I meet with the CEO for a cup of tea every fortnight and just say, well, have you thought about this? And I was at a function and so-and-so said that, and this, in my view, could affect your industry. Uh, it's, so it's those sorts of conversations, I think, that are also really important. It's there's not just one thing one can do. And I suppose if I've ever got a message, it's about really being in touch. Because when you're in, when you're in your little zone, your world is really important and often you don't even read the newspaper. You don't even, you, you know, you get, you get clippings. So you, you don't even see where those stories fit in the national or international narrative. So having people around you who can actually take whatever world you're in and put it in the national discussion and say, you know, you could actually be affected by this uh, and then get you thinking. I think that's, that's re really valuable. Thank you. Uh, we, we might go back and touch upon that social media question that we raised mm. uh, earlier. Uh, I do have a question from Tom Hadley and he runs a, a professional services engineering business. Um, and he divorces his business uh, from a social media perspective um, the, the, only, the only media that he uses is LinkedIn because it, 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 the perception that's uh, a professional forum and he makes no reference at all to his business in Facebook um, or other social media. Uh, in, in terms of your advice from businesses in terms of what they do with social media, how, in, how interactive should they be, and especially in that management of a crisis, um, being at the front foot of it, uh, what, what's your advice on that? Look, I think, you, I think I was trying to say probably very badly earlier that I think there's too much mystery around social media. It is just another tool, and you do have to, it is a tool of communication that one has to be aware of and, and use it well. I don't think you should lie awake at night and worry too much about somebody's just tweeted something terribly about me. Uh, you know, I, I have tweet deck open on my desk all the time and there are a few issues that I'm following and often there's only the same five or six boring old souls who are tweeting the same thing. That's not, to, and I don't want to, to be too flippant about it. Um, but I do think you do have to engage and I think if you uh, have a, a product that has a wide appeal, has a big audience and people want to give you feedback and you've got a page where you do actually have people chatting away, I think you've got to, got to think about that and be responsive. But you don't have to, you don't have to over engineer it to, you know, to use uh, was Mr Hadley's engineering firm. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> But you, you do have to have competent people who are responsive, who've got something to say, who don't wa worry if somebody's saying bad things about you and, and you know, basically writing what one used to write on toilet walls, writing on, on your blog. I don't think you have to worry too much, but you do have to actually have to deal with some of the things that are being said. And you can, you can just be quite rigid about it and disciplined about it. And there are very good advisors out there, but, but don't think it's too spooky and too mysterious. Just to follow on, like we, we are heavily involved on the Sydney Rooster side of the business. Uh, Facebook, we have over 160,000 followers. Uh, Twitter is over 40,000 followers. And, and all club statements will go on there, whether, mm. whether good or bad. Obviously, mm. with, with crisis management, we do post them on mm. there as well. Uh, we do have a lot of um, uh, comments, mm. uh, either positive or negative, um, especially if like, uh, we lose a player or that. Um, people, and we sign a player, either people are positive or negative. Um, so it is quite an open forum for us. Yeah. Uh, but it is a very uh, passionate business as well. 
uh, for, for us. Uh, look, it's, it can be so useful, um, but if, you, if you're going to make the decision, as you have done, to go out there and make it as another tool to communicate with your passionate supporters or customers or whoever they are, then you've got to take the good with the bad. And you can't freak out too much whenever somebody said something rather nasty about you. At the same time, you can't be too flippant about it. It sounds like you guys have got a lot to tell. <laughs> oh, there's, yeah, there's always something happening. <laughs> No, I, I think the challenge from a social media perspective is that you know, the, the, that Facebook profile from a, a corporate perspective, it's, it's similar a bit like a barbecue, barbecue type conversation rather than a business type conversation. Uh, if you elect to be part of the conversation, you need to be active in it. Um, I, I recollect early 2003, I think, there was a website called whirlpool.net, which was a couple of hundred thousand software engineers involved in it. And when, when I started Engine, I was very active on Whirlpool and we got our first 2,000 clients uh, from that particular uh, forum. But after a year, we got incredibly busy with work and, and I became inactive on that particular uh, forum. And we appointed employees to get engaged with that particular forum. And, and this is well before social media was coined as a term, but we had a bit of a backlash from that particular mm. client set that you know, Ilka was involved, Ilka was engaged, we're talking to the CEO, why is he not spending time with us on every, every, you know, every evening? And, uh, uh, and that became a bit of a challenge that, you know, um, once you set an expectation, you need to maintain that expectation. I agree with you, but that also could be a writing issue. Yes. See, I mean, I have, and these will be nameless, but I have worked with some very high prof profile people who, who the audience will believe he or she is talking to me all the yes. time, and they're not. Uh, they've got some good writers who know the values that this person wants to impart, knows the story, and can can continue that conversation. So it it doesn't. It, it might in your situation might have just been you just had some writers that might have needed to, a few little lessons on how to how to be you. No, no. Well, well we I think we elected that they would be that their own name and their own right. Oh, I see. Uh, and I they see. Were, they were and they wanted you, not some other... And, stuff. And, and the challenge was that they were there representing the company in their name, yeah. uh, not, not acting as me mm. you know, on behalf of the company. So um, we took a fairly, um, I, I guess, a honest view in terms of our relationship with our clients. Mm. And, uh, and so it took... Um, but the demands, once you do start down that pathway to become a, a, a communicator within a channel, the demands are quite... Yeah. Uh, quite high from a time perspective and, and as businesses grow rapidly uh, it's, it's hard to kind of balance that um, uh, that time um, you only have so many hours in a day and, and um, it becomes all consuming uh, from a communications perspective so the, the social media side I think is incredibly important um, but you need to invest in it and uh, if you don't invest in it then don't do it I, is, is, is my but opinion. don't be afraid of it either no absolutely too not too many people no, are no, scared of it and no. I really wish they wouldn't be because it can be quite a useful tool oh no 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 and if there's a problem you usually find that um, the supporters on your social media site will come up there in your defence and you don't they, they, they will very very quickly help sort out uh, some of the communication challenges that you have. So you get a balanced conversation coming through, mm. but every now and then you have a little spot fire, but I wouldn't lose any sleep over those spot fires, basically. Yeah, I yeah. agree with you. Okay. Um, just, uh, I'm aware of the time. We have uh, 10 minutes uh, to go. So if you do have any questions, uh, please uh, hit that uh, ask a question button uh, on, the, on the bottom right-hand corner uh, of the player. Um, just uh, very quickly, we did... Um, we haven't spoken about the reputational impact of a mismanaged crisis. Yes. And, I, and you know, one crisis, recent crisis comes to mind is the frozen berry issue. Yes. Uh, do you want to um, maybe give some thoughts about that particular crisis and, and how you manage that reputational impact? I don't want to talk about that particular crisis because I don't know enough about it. Okay. Um, I've been dealing with other crises <laughs> to know too much about it. My heart goes out to everybody involved though because it's a tough one when you have you know, a food that has been labelled the cause of terrible illnesses in people. Um, so let's not, let's not go there because we don't know, I don't know the facts. But what can I say about mis mismanaged crises? If I look at some of the crises that I have been involved in and you look back and think, how would I have done these differently? Often I think um, I've observed some, um, some people who have gone out and t spoken without having the facts and have 
I suppose, gone against their better judgment. I often say, trust that little voice inside yourself because usually it is right. If it, if it feels doesn't feel right, don't go there. Um, I'm pleased to say I haven't actually been involved in any mismanaged <laughs> crises. Uh, it's very self-serving, isn't it? Um, but what can one learn from them? I think, what, as I said earlier, what you can learn from any crisis is you get to know your own company really well and you get to test your own values and you get to test your, your management team. So I think you can, even from a mismanaged crisis, you can learn from that. And I have, I have had you know, anecdotes where people have come into me and said, my company went through this and we, you know, we, we, we'll never go through that again. Well, there's a good learning <laughs> for you. And we're going to make sure we don't go through that again and we're going to make sure that we're we're really well uh, trained for anything that comes. So I, th I think, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good to happen and people shouldn't just want to dive under the dunas when it all goes wrong, although I absolutely understand the, the need to want, to want to do that. I mean, you were talking about some of your players mm. who, where things have been handled really badly, some of them just can never recover. And that's, that's a tragedy when when people's lives get so drowned by the crisis that they are in that they never ever come out of it and the same thing can happen with a company. Mm. And that's where the player welfare management is, is the most important thing mm. in, the, in the game today because uh, the scrutiny on the, on the player has never been greater mm. with, with mobile phones and cameras. Mm. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, they're scrutinised 24-7. Mm. i tell you a lesson that happened to me, though. It brings to your social media um, story earlier, but uh, I was looking after a cri very big crisis for a client, and he was a rather you know, stuffy, he won't mind me saying this, stuffy sort of old Etonian chap, and he didn't believe in all this silliness about social media and all this stuff. And so the crisis was happening, and they were under a great deal of scrutiny, but he decided he was actually going to go on holiday, and he was going to go to this rather a very famous sporting match, sporting event. And I said, oh, no, you're not. And he was like, of course I am. And I said, look, I just cannot bear the thought of you on the front page in the front row of this rather salubrious sporting event. Oh, he said, nobody will know. I'm, nobody knows anything about me. No one knows me. So I went back to my office and I Googled his name. And lo and behold, what came up was his mate, who was equally stuffy but a little, little bit more savvy, was on a world cruise and he was blogging. And he was saying, oh, I can't wait to meet my friend Joe Blow at the XYZ uh, sporting event next month in this. <laughs> and so I said to him, you know, if I can find this out, the photographers can too. So let's, let's not go to that sporting event. And he, and he didn't. But he said, he, he still, we bump into each other occasionally and he still talks about that. And he says that was the big learning from, from him, that he really had to be careful about every every bit the way that he behaved during that crisis and how it could easily have been twisted and you can mm. imagine couldn't you this terrible crisis is happening and there he is quaffing champagne in some rather grand event it just would never have looked good not that he could have done much anyway everyone needs to holiday as that poor fellow said in the in the oil oh, you know in the oil dispute where the sorry where the oil uh, accident happened mm. and he said I want my life back I mean my goodness if only he could have eaten those words yeah so I'm, I'm, we've talked a lot about um, what to do in a crisis as a CEO. What are the things not to do in a crisis? Well, not to say those things like I want my life back yeah. when everybody else is suffering a great deal more than you are. I think that's about it. It's about, being, it's about perspective. It's not really about you, yes. particularly if you've got a, a consumer good where people have actually suffered or, or been greatly put out because of something that's going on so it is to to try as much as possible to empathize with the others in your situation with um, young men I suppose it's again trying to get them to think about the effect that their silly behavior has had on whoever it was that they were silly to <laughs> and to the club as yeah. well empathize obviously not ignore it and as you said don't go under the dunas uh, but also the the quickest one I've ever been experiencing was the the recent one we had in the Lees club where it was reported that someone was found in um, our fire stairs where it wasn't our fire stairs but we didn't ignore it we investigated it um, and when we found it wasn't our fire stairs our media manager was straight onto it um, and let it be known that it wasn't our fire stairs and was redirected elsewhere. Mm. So we're on the front foot. Yeah, I think that's right. If, if, this is, if there's something wrong out there about your company, fix it. Make sure that people know that they have made a mistake. Mm. 
So one, one, one of the last questions we have is, is, is about delivering, how best to deliver bad news. And uh, Tom also asked in terms of uh, his experience in outplacement consultant is that management doesn't handle delivering bad news very well, especially when, when you're going to make a, uh, a large number of layoffs in an organisation. Mm. Um, what's your advice in terms of delivering that news? And this is to an internal audience rather than to an external audience. I think you just have to be jolly honest. Yeah. Um, you know, the old saying, never kid a kidder. And again, you know, I can't em emphasise this too much, but please remember it's not about you, even though it's really uncomfortable to deliver that bad news. Think about the person who's receiving it. Mm. Don't use silly jargon and waffly old sentences. Sometimes I've, you know, I've read some statements where people are laying off quite a lot of people and they've taken forever to get to the, to the, the real story. And it's quite insulting to whoever you're delivering that message to, yes. to want to waffle on. Respect them and be honest. Yep. Scott? Uh, I totally agree there. The statements that they need to be short and sharp and honest, that uh, there's no waffling on. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Uh, we're getting close to our time. I might just do a very quick just wrap up of our conversation today. Um, uh, I, you know, the key points that are coming through are each crisis is different. Um, you have to acknowledge the suffering, and that, that acknowledging the suffering is actually comes um, is in line with um, uh, the World Health Organization and, and the Red Cross uh, on what uh, they have protocols for managing major crises around the world. And one of their, one of their uh, initial comments that you need to do is reduce initial stress. So uh, a lot of what we've talked about today is quite aligned with uh, what our major um, uh, service organisations do in a global uh, perspective. Um, um, don't, you know, don't be pushed to do a conference uh, when it's not required. You know, trust the team around you. It's not just about one person communicating. It is a team response, and that team does move down all the way through to your call centre environment, your frontline staff that are responding um, to, your, um, to the crisis. And, you know, Look after your staff, look after the people that are involved in the process, that they need support uh, through that. You know, they've got current needs that need to be met and you know, they need to cope with the crisis themselves uh, in their own manner. So being uh, empathetic to, you, to your, uh, your staff needs and, and, and very much from a leadership perspective, you know, remaining calm uh, is key and that's um, in, from a management perspective managing that calm through you know, deep breaths and um, uh, preparing yourself uh, adequately before you do go out there and speak publicly, whether that's internally or externally, and, and making sure that you know, having that honest conversation, uh, being empathetic through that process, and having that real conversation with people out there that um, people understand where you're coming from and how you're dealing with this particular crisis as a business. And, and being honest with it, and having great advisors along. I think, I mean, uh, when um, I've always used um, PR and, and, and crisis management uh, people to help us in the businesses that I've run, and I think having a good team around you is absolutely imperative to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to thank both Jacqueline and Scott for your time this afternoon. It's been absolutely wonderful, and uh, thank you very much for the audience for your participation today. Hopefully you all got something out of it, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.